Hello everyone and welcome to another PAP Problems video. My name is Helena and I'm the Access and Outreach Manager for the Department of Materials at the University of Oxford and today we're going to be taking a look at the long question from the 2011 PAP paper. Now the PAP papers as they currently stand don't have this sort of long question format to finish them off. However, looking at past PAP paper, long questions are still good practice. So we're going to have a look at the first half of the 2011 long question today. So let's have a look. So here we have an archer who draws the string of her bow back a distance of 0.6 meters and holds it there with a force of 120 newtons before releasing an arrow of mass 20 grams. What is the speed of the arrow when it leaves the bowstring, assuming that all of the energy in the bow is imparted to the arrow? Okay, so let's set this question up. So I'm gonna draw myself a little diagram. So I'm gonna have my bow pulled back here. And we're told that it's pulled back a distance of 0.6 meters. So that's the extension of the bowstring there. So X is 0.6 meters. And we have our arrow here. And that has a mass M, where M is 20 grams. And I'm going to convert this into kilograms here. So I've got everything in SI units. That's 0.02 kilograms. And we're told that the archer is holding this back with a force, which is equal to 120 newtons. And we want to find the speed of the arrow once it is released, assuming all the energy gets put into the kinetic energy of the arrow. Okay, so let's start by considering Hooke's law on the bowstring here. So Hooke's law states that the force is equal to minus k, where k is the spring constant of the bowstring here, times the extension. And this force here is the restorative force acting in this direction to try and pull the bowstring back to its equilibrium position. And because we know that the archer is holding this still, we know that the restorative force must be equal to the force that she is pulling it back as. So we know that the F here is 120 newtons in this equation as well. So let's rearrange this in order to find the spring constant. So K is equal to minus F over X here. And because we have the, uh, the force going this way and the extension going in the opposite direction, we can write this as 120 divided by the extension here, 0.6. So we've got 120 newtons divided by 0.6 meters, which gives us a value of 200 newtons per meter for the spring constant here, okay. And so we want to find the energy of the, of the, of the bowstring as it's being held back. So the energy stored in the, in the bow is equal to a half times k times x squared. And that potential energy stored in the bow, we are told that all of it is imparted into the arrow as it's released. So all of that is converted into the kinetic energy of the arrow, which is a half mv squared. Okay, and we want to find v here. So let's rearrange this equation and find v. So we can cancel out the half factors of a half here, and we can write this as v squared equals k x squared divided by the mass m. And we know all of these values, so we can substitute this in here. So it's equal to 200 times 0.6 squared, all divided by the mass in SI units in kilograms, which is 0.02, which if we work that out, we get a value of 3,600, which means that the velocity must be the square root of this, the positive square root, and that would be a velocity of 60 meters per squared uh, per second here. So that's the answer to the first part. Okay. So moving on to the second part, we are told that in fact the stored energy of the bow not only accelerates the arrow, but also the arms of the bow itself. So only a fraction h of the original stored energy is imparted to the arrow. So rather than having all of the stored energy being converted to kinetic energy, we only have a fraction of it this time. So if that fraction is 25 over 36, what is the actual speed of the arrow leaving the bow? OK, 
Okay, so if we go back to our energy conversion, uh, conservation of energy equation here, instead of having all of this turning into kinetic energy, we only have 25 36 of that stored energy turning into kinetic energy. So let's add in that factor to this equation we have here. So we have 25 over 36 times the half kx squared getting turned into the kinetic energy of the arrow, the half mv squared. So again, if we rearrange this, we'll find that v squared equals this factor, this 25 over 36, times the original expression we had over here, the kx squared over m. And we've worked that out. So that's equal to 25 36 of 3,600 here, which nicely gives us a value of 2,500. And again, if we take the square root here, we get a value of the velocity of 50 meters per second. So now when we take into account uh, not all of the energy being stored in the bow being transferred to the arrow, we have a slight decrease in the arrow's velocity. Excellent. So what does the next part of the question tell us? So the archer is aiming at a target, which makes sense, which is a distance of 50 meters away. Okay, so we've got a distance of 50 meters between the archer and the target. How long will it take for the arrow to reach the target, assuming the arrow does not slow through air friction? Okay, so for this part question, we simply have nice, easy, uniform motion. So we have the distance that the uh, arrow is going to travel between the archer and the target of 50 meters. We've already calculated the velocity as 50 meters per second. And we want to find the time that it's going to take for the arrow to reach the target. So with a simple speed equals distance over time equation, we can rearrange that to get the time, which is the distance over the speed, which is 50 meters divided by 50 meters per second, which gives us a time of one second. So a nice simple part question there. Okay. And the next part of the question here is now asking us to consider the effects of gravity and estimate how far above the center of the target the archer must aim to ensure the arrow strikes the middle. So in this case, we've got to consider sort of horizontal and vertical motion here. So in reality, the arch will be aiming at a certain angle, say theta above the horizontal, and so the velocity will have a horizontal and a vertical component. So because we want to consider the effects of gravity, we want to consider the vertical motion here. So what do we know about vertical uh, components. So we know that the archer releases the arrow from rest, so we know that u, the initial velocity, is zero. We know that the acceleration must be the acceleration due to gravity. So if we take the upwards direction as positive, we know that the acceleration will be downwards and we'll take a value of g. So let's make this easy for ourselves and let's uh, approximate g to be 10. So we have minus 10 meters per second squared. And we've also just calculated in the previous part that the time of flight of the arrow is going to be one second. And we want to find the vertical distance that the arrow is going to travel so that we know how high we need to aim above the center of the target. So what equation can we use for this? Well, we can use the classic s equals u t plus a half a t squared here. The initial velocity is zero, so we can get rid of that. So we know that the distance travelled is the half a t squared. So, and that's the vertical, the vertical distance travelled. So let's put in our numbers. We have a half times the acceleration due to gravity, which is minus 10, times the time, which is 1 squared. So we have that the vertical distance is minus five meters. So remember how I defined the positive direction as upwards? So this means that the arrow has moved five meters downwards while it's been flying through the air, which makes sense. So therefore, the archer must aim 
five meters above the target in order for the arrow to strike the center. Okay, so that's the first half of that question there. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. If you want to try the rest of the question for yourself, there are just a couple more parts left, um, but this was the bulk of the question in this case. And I hope that was useful. That's just one way you can go about solving this equation, uh, this question. And uh, hopefully we will see you next time when Catherine will be going through uh, a couple of questions from the maths part of the 2012 paper. So we'll be taking a look at questions eight and nine from 2012. So see you next time.